This is the second video on the DNA replication unit. I've actually gone through everything I plan to go over with regard to DNA replication. What I'd like to do in this video is go over a few things that are peripherally related to DNA replication. Those topics are, first of all, mutations that very commonly occur during this DNA replication process. This is found in chapter 18. And then also two types of biotechnologies that use DNA polymerase. And this would be found in chapter 19. It's PCR and DNA sequencing. So first, I'd like to talk about the things that can happen during DNA replication, mistakes that get made leading to mutation. During the time that DNA is replicated, this is really a vulnerable time. And so we have these new bases coming in opposite that template strand, and sometimes you get a mismatch. And so maybe a C pa pairs with an A, for example. This happens at a low rate, and these can normally be fixed. So sometimes DNA polymerase itself will fix those mistakes. And even if this type of mistake gets made, you get a little mismatch here. Sometimes that will be actually fixed by the DNA repair machinery in the cell. However, if this cell is dividing really rapidly, there may not be time for all of the mismatches to be fixed. And so this kind of mistake can actually be propagated. And so here, the top strand, uh, the TTCG, uh, should have coded for an A, instead it coded for a G. And if that cell quickly undergoes another DNA replication before it gets fixed, we actually propagate a mutant. And this one in the next S phase will now code for another strand and it will permanently put another base into the DNA. Another thing that can happen is something called replication slippage. And what that is, is if there are repetitive DNA sequences, it's possible for one of the strands to actually kind of loop out. So in this figure, we have a substrate for DNA polymerase, and this top strand is the newly synthesized strand, the bottom strand is the template. What can happen is if the newly synthesized strand loops out, it's still going to be able to base pair correctly because of that repetitive sequence. And so uh, this A can still pair with the T, and you will continue on making a piece of DNA. In the end, you will get an insertion of a base of DNA. If that looping out occurs in the template strand, you actually get one fewer A's put in here in that repetitive region, and you would end up with a deletion of one base. Now, there is a whole class of human genetic disorders that are caused by replication slippage, and these are called trinucleotide repeat disorders. I'm going to tell you in a little bit of detail about one of them, one that we've talked about before, Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a dominantly inherited disorder of neurodegeneration. And the reason why neurons degenerate is because you have these big protein aggregates that accumulate in the cells. This eventually leads to cell death. Now, why do these proteins aggregate? It turns out they aggregate because they have these extra long stretches of glutamine amino acids in the protein. These extra long glutamine stretches are caused by an expansion of this codon CAG. And so CAG, normally in the Huntington gene, people have between 6 and 34 CAG repeats. However, in the disease state, this CAG repeat region has been expanded, and individuals have 36 or higher CAG repeats. If you get this many glutamines called for in that protein, that is when we get this aberrantly folded protein that then causes these aggregates that lead to neuronal cell death. Here is a list of a few other trinucleotide repeat disorders. I just want to point out the ones that have the uh, repeat expansion found in the coding region are mostly actually CAGs. And so this problem of extra glutamines actually affects different proteins. And as soon as you get to this threshold of around you know 35 or so glutamines, you actually start to get this disease state that leads to neurodegeneration. There are also trinucleotide repeats that occur outside of the protein coding region of genes. These examples, uh, they work by some different mechanisms, often to inhibit the function of that protein. 
Next, I'd like to talk about two biotechnologies that use DNA polymerase enzyme. The first one will be PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. So this is a very, very useful technique that can be used to make a whole bunch of identical copies of a particular piece of DNA. You can start out with just very few pieces of DNA template and end up with millions of copies of that particular piece of DNA. This was a technique that was invented in 1983 by Kerry Mullis, and he actually got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. This is one technique that is probably used just about more than any other technique in molecular biology labs today. And so the idea here is we have this region of the genome and these synthetic pieces of DNA called primers, they're about 20 bases long, it's single-stranded DNA, are used to amplify the region between those two primers. So we've looked at this before um, as a technique for how do we identify the number of uh, repeats that individuals have on uh, molecular markers. Right, so this individual has five repeats. They have a smaller length of DNA between those two primers, while this individual with nine repeats has a longer piece of DNA between those two primers. So the way polymerase chain reaction works is that you do three different steps sequentially, and then you go back and repeat those three steps over and over. Okay, do those three steps, and then you go back and start at the beginning, and do those three steps again and again until you do it about 30 times. The very first step is a denaturation step. So you start out with this double-stranded DNA and by heating it to about 95 degrees Celsius, you actually separate those two strands of DNA. You, you break the hydrogen bonds that form between the bases in those two strands of DNA. So now you have two strands that have separated from each other. And the next step is to reduce the temperature sufficiently and add the primers. So these are the single-stranded pieces of DNA that are synthetically synthesized. And these primers will then base pair with the exact complement. That would be called the annealing step. And then the third step is the extension step. In this step, we'd raise the temperature a little bit more, and we would add DNA polymerase and nucleotides for the synthesis of new DNA. Now, if you look at this strand, what you'll notice is that this is actually a template for DNA polymerase. You have a template strand up on the top here, and you have a strand that is going to get this new strand started, right? And so DNA polymerase can bind to this and begin synthesizing over in this direction. This is the five prime end, and DNA polymerase will synthesize five prime to three prime, so going from right to left on this particular piece. It will continue going until you get to the end, and now you have a new double-stranded DNA. The same thing happens on the other strand. So here the primer will bind here and DNA polymerase binds to it and synthesizes in this direction from left to right. The new strand then shown in orange um, is uh, double stranded and after one cycle you have instead of one piece of double stranded DNA now you have two pieces that are identical to each other. That would be one cycle, and now we would go through and do those steps one through three again, right? So this one, the two strands will get separated from each other, and in the annealing step, the primers would bind, and then in the extension step, the DNA polymerase would bind and synthesize that new strand. So after the next step, you had have four total pieces of DNA instead of one. Now what happens is that after about five cycles, you get 32 molecules if you start out with one. And after 30 cycles, you actually get over a billion molecules of DNA, double-stranded DNA, that are all identical to that original piece of DNA that you amplified. Next, I'd like to talk about DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing is the technique that tells us what the order of the bases is on chromosomes. It can be used for bacterial chromosomes or human chromosomes, whatever species you want, you can sequence the DNA and figure out the order of bases on those chromosomes.
This was a method that was invented way back in 1977 by Fred Sanger, and it's been immensely, immensely important. He invented this technique called dye deoxy sequencing, and this is essentially the same idea that is still used today. There have been huge improvements in the scale at which that sequencing can be done, but the basic idea of how it works is still very similar. So DNA sequencing was used to figure out the sequence of the entire human genome. This was completed in 2003 and it took about 15 years, costed about $3 billion. Um, sequencing technology has improved so much that today you can actually sequence an entire human genome in just one overnight experiment and it costs about $1,000. So I'm going to tell you how dye deoxy sequencing works. So the idea here is that you use DNA polymerase to synthesize new pieces of DNA and you use the normal building blocks for DNA, which would be ATP, GTP, CTP, and TTP, right? We call these DNTPs. And just remember that those normal bases all have this particular structure. Right, so this structure on the three prime carbon is an OH. And if you remember, DNA polymerase always adds new bases onto the three prime end of an existing strand. And particularly that OH is critical. If you want to add new bases, this is the place where it's added. If you don't have that OH, you can't add any more bases to that strand. Now what's used in dye deoxy sequencing is a very small amount of a slightly different type of nucleotide called a dye deoxy nucleotide. So what this is, is that we do not have an OH on the three prime carbon of that nucleotide. The result of that is that if you insert that particular base, it terminates that strand and no more bases can be added after that. So here's a diagram for how dye deoxy sequencing works. It's a bit complicated, but I'd like you guys to understand this. So here's the piece of DNA to be sequenced. It is a single stranded DNA and to that a primer has been added. So here is a small primer and the three prime end would be right here. To that DNA template, we add DNA polymerase enzyme and also the DNTPs, all of the bases required for normal DNA. This mix would then be split into four tubes. Each of these tubes has a small amount of dye deoxynucleotide of a particular type that is added. So let's go through this one on the left. So here we have very small amount of dye deoxy ATP as well as a lot of normal ATP. The DNA polymerase will bind to this substrate and will begin to synthesize a new strand of DNA on the end of that primer. And the template is the thing that actually calls for a particular base. So as that DNA polymerase moves down the DNA, every time it gets to a place where an A is called for, there are two possible things that can happen. Either a normal A can be put across from that T, in which case that strand would continue to be synthesized, or else a di deoxy A could by chance be inserted in at that particular spot. If a di deoxy nucleotide is inserted, that particular DNA polymerase reaction will terminate. And so what happens here is that this particular template, every place where you saw a T that an A was called for, you're going to get a population of pieces of DNA that have terminated at that particular spot. And if you run that on a gel, what you'll find is that you actually separate those three populations of sizes of DNA strands into three, right? And so this is the smallest one. This one would correspond to that very short piece of DNA. This one is the intermediate one. And then this one would be the longest one. The very same thing is done only spiking that reaction with a little bit of di deoxy CTP or GTP or TTP. And in each case, you get a population of pieces of DNA of a particular size where that di deoxy base was called for.
when you run all of these reactions next to each other on the sequencing gel, this can actually be used to figure out the sequence of that original piece of DNA. So that very smallest piece of DNA that was synthesized is in that G column, right? Because that very first base on the template was a C. Okay, so we called for a G there. That meant the first base in the template strand that we're sequencing is a C. The next smallest band is in the A column. Therefore, the next base in that particular template was a T, and so forth. Now, there have been a number of really important modifications that have been made to dideoxy sequencing. One of the first improvements that was made was actually, instead of using four different dideoxynucleotides in four different reactions, each dideoxynucleotide had a different fluorescent dye on it. So it could all be done in the very same reaction instead of four separate ones. And then machines were used actually to read the, that fluorescent signal after that reaction was separated on a gel. More recently, there was a new kind of sequencing that has been invented called next generation sequencing. This technology has really been a huge step forward and it has vastly increased the amount of DNA that you can sequence at one time. And so, as you can see over the years, the cost for sequencing was slowly, slowly going down. And in 2007, when next generation sequencing was developed, the cost actually began to plummet. The idea in next generation sequencing is really the same general idea as the dideoxy sequencing, except it has become what we call massively parallel. So the idea here is that you take individual pieces of DNA that you'd like to sequence and you put them on a plate in lots of different locations. So maybe there are a million different spots on this particular plate. And then you add new bases, again using DNA polymerase and fluorescent nucleotides. I should just mention that there are a number of different companies that have developed next generation sequencing and they vary a little bit between the different uh, technologies. 